Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with a linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must be raised from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where of you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and to him she, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your abundant grace and mercy, your love, and the act of sending your son here to this earth to die on the cross and to be raised to new life. Father, we pray, especially for this morning, that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you want to teach us through your scriptures today. We pray that you will give Pastor Jeremy the words to speak, that you will give him strength and courage and boldness to share the gospel as he always does. And Lord, we pray that our hearts would be open to the truth that is found in scriptures about you and about our purpose in life. In Jesus' name, amen. This next song is a song that many people know throughout the world. Um, so I'd love to invite you to sing it along with us. We'll have the words up on screen for you, but it is a time for reflection as well. So um, feel free to sing.
Lord, we thank you for your grace, your amazing grace. The grace that saw a way, that made a way to unite us with you, Lord, to cleanse us of our sin that separates us from you. God, we accept that grace. We are so grateful for it. Lord, I pray that you will open our hearts and open our ears to you and to what you have to say to us today, Lord. And it is in your name I pray this. Amen. Good morning, church. So, I think what we did earlier earlier today is I'm going to say he is risen. And uh, if, if you're not used to this, you're just going to say back to me, he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. The, the beauty of... The beauty of the resurrection and what we are learning today, what we are celebrating today, is that a miracle happened. And I think this is where a lot of people, <laughs> including myself, and, and this is where if you, if you get to know me, um, I, I try to the best of my ability uh, be as logical as I can. I, I don't like, <laughs> I don't even like it when people are too frou-frou with spirituality. I, I really don't. I know I'm a pastor. I should be used to that. Um, but when people talk outside of what makes sense, what I can see, I, I'm not really good with that. I mean, I'm, I'm really good when people have hard facts and they can explain things to me and I can tangibly grasp it and understand it. Um, in, in, especially in my education um, from, from even elementary school on into college, I, I love studying science. I love, I love studying you know, physics. I love studying biology. I love studying chemistry and all these different areas because why? It was provable. There is a scientific method in which you can explain how things work. You can explain the natural world. And that's all well and good. I, I'm, not, I'm not here to, to say that that's not right. In many ways, that's how we live our lives. We are uh, created beings, physical beings that have tangible attributes that we can see and touch and understand. There are laws regarding physics. There are laws regarding the way things work. If you, if you know just, uh, just a general sense, it's like the idea that we're made up of tiny little molecules and those molecules are made up of even tinier little atoms. And it's very fascinating that we are even put together in this way. That's all the natural world. And, and this is where a lot of times when we come to church, we're stuck in the natural world. That we find ourselves in conversation with people who are stuck in the natural world. And I am not here I am not here to say any of that is wrong. I'm not here to, to say that your perspective regarding the natural world is wrong. We are made up of molecules, of atoms, and, and we are comprised of, of chemicals, and your brain has neurons that are firing in certain ways for you to be able to perceive and even hear me right now that this is all a part of the natural. But, 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 today what we're talking about is the fact that there is something that happened that was supernatural. And, and again, before you just tune me out and say, okay, this is where he gets through through spiritual and he becomes a little out there. I, I want to explain the whole point of the resurrection is that Jesus' ministry up until this point was tangible. People saw it and they, they, could, they could sense it and, and feel it. And even the miracles that he did, they were these tangible miracles. They were pointing to a God who was in the supernatural. A God who, who wanted to, to touch them, to speak to them, to have a relationship with them. And the disciples were acting and operating in this way. But they were simply following him. The resurrection, the resurrection does something amazing. 
What the resurrection is doing, and, and the reason why we celebrate as Christians is because as, we, as the disciples saw Jesus do these miracles, it really was Jesus who was doing these miracles. Jesus was the one interacting with his Father in heaven, and he was the one having the supernatural relationship with God, but that's Jesus. I mean, that's Jesus. He's the one who, I mean, whether he was a prophet, whether he was just the ultimate teacher, he had a special connection with God. He had a special connection with the supernatural. But guys like Peter, they were just simple fishermen. Peter was, was more used to just seeing and, and interacting with his world. If anything, he understood the weight of nets. He understood how to navigate on a boat. He understood the practical things. But the resurrection changes everything. The resurrection changes everything because the resurrection is where Jesus is saying, now you, now you can have a part in the supernatural. That you can now experience the supernatural, the things that are outside of this world, if you believe. And this really is the crux of the Christian faith. The Christian faith isn't just about being a good person and doing good deeds. And the reason why I say that is because then you're just still stuck in the natural. You're still stuck in just doing good things unto other people, and then it ends there. And by any logic, you would be right. When you feed someone who is hungry, it ends in the natural. When you, when you give someone clothing to someone who doesn't have any clothes, you are meeting their natural needs. Today... On this day of Easter, we are celebrating the supernatural. We are celebrating a miracle that has happened. And I, I want to make it really clear. I, I, in my natural self, have no ability to perform a miracle. But what Easter is all about is not that we are the ones to perform the miracles, but we are witness to a God that can do miracles. A God who cannot be proven nor disproven by science, by the observable universe, because he resides both in the physical as well as outside of this box that we live in, this universe that we're in, that we believe that a God is, is transcendent above these things and he sent his one and only son to live this perfect life, but to die the brutal and shameful death of a criminal on the cross. And really, when I look at our faith, when I look at the Christian faith, in many ways, all of what happens up until Good Friday when Jesus is hanging there makes sense in the natural. Because, I mean, even if you have a miracle worker, someone who's doing magic tricks and someone who's able to do these amazing things, I'm sure there's many ways for us to rationalize and say, well... You know, when he was doing those things, when he uh, multiplied the loaves and fishes, it really wasn't him multiplying the loaves and fishes. It was really people just brought in more food. And, and obviously, you can't just make things happen out of thin air. And, and even stories like Jesus walking on water, or, or my favorite, Jesus turning water into wine, it's not that it was a miracle. It was just something that happened, um, a, a magic trick per se, where he was just doing a sleight of hand. And it was water, and all of a sudden he, he prayed over it in, in those large ceremonial jars, and he did a switcheroo. And, and so all those miracles can be rationalized as being of the natural. And I will say, I will say, even if all of Jesus' earthly miracles were disproven, e even if all of his earthly miracles were disproven, there is one miracle that happens... One miracle that we are here, gathered here today, that if this miracle does not happen, then we have no parts. We have no part in the power of God. And this miracle is the miracle of Jesus being raised from the dead. And, and I think this is where many people will say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Didn't Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? So what's so special about Jesus being raised from the dead? Again, you know, preacher man, you're talking about these miracles, and the Bible is full of these fairy tales. It's full of these stories that don't really make any logical sense. But we've already heard this one where Jesus has, a, has the power to raise a dead body into life. 
The thing is about the story with Lazarus is he raised Lazarus from the dead, and Lazarus was in Lazarus' body. What happens here and what we're going to get over, what we're going to dive into as we see Mary Mary Magdalene meet the resurrected Christ, it wasn't like Lazarus' resurrection. It wasn't this resurrection where it was clearly Lazarus who came out of the cave and, and Jesus now is clearly the one coming out of the tomb. But we see Mary Magdalene see Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and she doesn't even recognize him. A man that she has been following, she has been a disciple of, maybe without the full term, but she's been following Jesus. She's a follower of Christ, that she sees the resurrected Christ and she thinks he's just some common gardener. He th- she thinks he's just the guy that kind of takes care of the area that she's in. This miracle that happens to our Lord, this miracle of God touching the natural world, this miracle is so paramount that if someone was able to disprove this miracle, then we would have no faith. I would have no faith. I, I would have to hang up my hat and say, you know what, you're absolutely right. This is all a sham. This is all a lie, but really, this is what I am proclaiming today. And this is what I want to proclaim every single Easter. Is not that I can do a miracle. Is that I am one to proclaim a miracle that God has done. And I want to witness to you the power of the Most High God. And I want to explain to you why this resurrection, Jesus coming back from the grave, is more important than all the other miracles. Again, not to throw away the importance of Jesus' earthly miracles, but the resurrection is one in which we are invited to be with him. The first point for today is is this. The power of resurrection, the power of God bringing Jesus to life in this new body is that it is a sign that the new covenant has been fulfilled. And if you were with us in my previous series, we went over the new covenants. But what Jesus is explaining is that his new covenant is this better covenant than the old. The old covenant is probably what you've heard in churches before. The old covenant is uh, this, this system in which you need to do good works. Because the more good works you do, the more God is pleased with your good works. And it shows your relationship with God. And so I think in many ways... Some well-meaning religious people think, I need to do good. I need to do good for God to accept me and for God to know that, hey, I love you, God. And so the way I show you my love is by following your law and following the things that I'm supposed to follow. The new covenant flips this on its head. The new covenant is not about you doing good works. The new covenant is God saying, I will do the work. I will be the one who does does all the work. You do not need to do anything except to believe. And so Jesus on, um, on Passover explains to his disciples in Luke chapter 22 verse 20. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten. Saying, this cup is, is, is this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And the reason why this is so important is as Jesus is having Passover and he's, uh, he's passing around the bread, which is his body, and he passes around the cup, which is his blood, is that he's explaining that his blood needs to be shed, his blood needs to be poured out so that you can be covered in this new blood. And what this means is that Jesus, through, through the shedding of his own blood, creates a new way to God. Hebrews 8, verse 6 says this, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. The new covenant, and and the way Hebrews explains this, the writer of Hebrews explains, the new covenant is better than the old one. And like I was saying before, the old covenant in many ways is this religious spirit, this religious system that you have to do good in order for you to have a relationship with God. And I think as I, I hear people talk about the church and talk about spirituality, it comes down to a lot of you have a lot of work to do. 
You got to do good things. And the more good things you do, the more God will accept and love you. And this is where we love to be like, yeah, that sounds right. Because if I'm a good person, God will see that I'm a good person and I do good things. And I'm sure the Old Testament has a lot to say about me doing good works so that God knows I'm loyal to him. That I have faith in him. That my works are really important. You see, this new ministry, and, and know that that old ministry, that old ministry, it wasn't wrong for God to say that. There is an importance of works. There is an importance for action. And this is not for us to say, okay, so if we're going to throw away the old, then the new must not include works whatsoever. No, the new, the new covenant includes works completely. But the work, the work that needs to be done is the one that was done on the cross. The work that is done is done through the life and ministry of Jesus where he explained love God and love others. And Jesus did a ministry where the work was done perfectly. And he did it so perfectly that they killed him for it. They, they, They crucified him. And this again really is as we're looking at the ministry of Jesus, many times even historians will say Jesus was a historical figure. He existed and he was this teacher. And there's proof, there's documentation proof that Jesus was a real man and he was, a, he was having this ministry. And, and all that is great. All of it's wonderful that we can verify that Jesus actually existed. But you see, this new ministry, the new ministry that Jesus had was to fulfill this new covenant. And it's to say... That God loved us so much. That God cared about us so much that he's even saying the responsibility of your sanctification, of your justification, the, the responsibility of your salvation is not even up to you for you to work on. That you need to do the right things to be saved. That he is going to do it through his son. That he is going to do it through his son who he will send down, and that it's through this one man. It's through this Jesus. It's through this person that now the burden of the work is on him and not on me and not on you. And perhaps this is the... the, (laughs) This is what the whole crux of what being a Christian is for me, is that now I've been told by God, that I am not saved through my own works. And I think there's a, a, there's a part of me, and I've been a Christian since I was a young boy, uh, and don't put that against me. I grew up in the church, and in many ways, I don't know how many times I really was told that my work, my work wasn't what saved me. That my actions weren't what saved me. I, I think I was told a lot, no, you need to be a good boy. You need to do the right thing. You need to make sure that you are keeping it all together. The beauty of the resurrection, the beauty of the power of resurrection is that we are saying the risen one, it is his work. And his work is a supernatural one. It is one that is above a higher order than what I am able to do. That Jesus' ministry here on this earth wasn't just the ministry of a lowly man or a simple teacher. That his ministry was the ministry of God. And because his ministry ended in what we would call failure. His teaching ended, his life ended in what we would deem a catastrophe. But the resurrection changes that story and says no. The reason why it had to end that way, the reason why he had to go on a cross wasn't because of abject failure. No, the reason it had to end that way is that is the way for you to understand that the entrance to the kingdom of God begins, begins with the shedding of blood. And not your blood, it begins with the shedding of his blood. That the way that God is going to pay the price for you to have a relationship with him, to fulfill this new covenant, that there is a cost. And it's this cost that we should be humbled by. Why would God, why, why would God shed his blood for me? It makes very little sense. I mean, let alone I'm talking about the supernatural and how little sense That makes, but why, why would God shed his precious blood for me? 
Why would he do that? And, and again, I'm not saying I have the answer to why and, and the exact details. I, I, I have a hunch. It's because he loves you and he cares about you. And you see, this is where we begin to, uh, this is where the natural and the supernatural begin to collide. You see, I, I began this by saying that the natural, that science and chemistry, it all, it all makes sense. And I, I love that it makes sense. I mean, I, there are laws and there are things that make a lot of sense. But when you begin to talk about things like love, when you begin to try to boil down the basic human emotion, such as love, and not to say that love is only an emotion, but the idea of love, the idea that you care about someone so much that you would lay down your life for them makes little sense to the natural world. And this is where people will say, oh, no, no, it makes a lot of sense because if you lay down your life for someone, um, if I laid my life down for my children, it's because I want my, my genetics, my DNA to continue to spread. And so it's not really about me being, me being a good person or, or me loving them. It's all just the chemistry in my brain saying, oh, you love your kids and you need to sacrifice for them. It is what's just pre-wired in you. But I think there is something a little bit deeper about love. Something deeper about these connections that we have with one another. And again, I know I may be losing you because you're thinking to yourself, no, love is just a feeling. No, I think there's something supernatural about love. I think there's something supernatural when you have that moment where you love someone and you care about them. But the reason why I say this isn't even from my own anecdotal experience. It's because the way God looks at us, there is nothing in God that he saw in us. That he didn't see anything in us that says, wow, you're impressive, you're amazing, you're wonderful. I love you because you're wonderful. No, while we were broken, while we were dirty and just rolling around in the mud, God God looked at us and said, I want them. I desire them. I want relationship with them. And I can imagine the other angels just talking to God and being like, you want them? Those guys, the ones who curse your name, the ones who don't even recognize you as being the creator, the, one, the ones who turn their back on you time and time again, the ones who kill each other, the ones who hurt one another, the ones who manipulate each other, you love them? God, you must be crazy because if you're going to love someone, you should love the good ones. And God looks down at his creation and says, yeah, you're right. They're pretty mean. They're pretty selfish. They're pretty dirty. They're addicted to the things of this world. They don't recognize me as their creator. They, they think that they created themselves. They think that they have all the power and all the glory and all the majesty. They find themselves to be impressive they, they, they manipulate one another. They lie to each other. Oh, man, they're terrible. But I love them. and I love them so much. And I don't want to, them to live that way. I don't want them rolling around in the, in the mud. And so what am I going to do? Well, maybe I'll start off with saying, you need to live up to my standards. You need to. And I'm calling you as my people. You need to live up to my standards. And the angels are probably saying, that's a good idea, God. Get them to become righteous first. And then they can have a relationship with you. They have faith in you and then righteous through you. And then they're clean and you can have a proper relationship. And God says, okay, we'll, we'll call this the covenant that I have with them. And I'll choose a specific nation. I'll choose the Israelites. And they'll have a relationship with me. And they'll remain loyal to me. And God experiences the heartbreak the heartbreak that comes so often when love is broken, when that relationship is broken, that deep groaning when your heart feels like it's being ripped in two, that God feels that because his people rejected him. And you see, this is where the angels are probably saying, God, you see these people, they're terrible. They, they did, they're garbage. You show them all of your power. You send miracle after miracle, showing them how great of a God you are. These Israelites should understand, should understand that you are not only real, but you are their king, and they're clamoring for their own king. They're clamoring for their own ways. And God says, yeah, you're right, but I love them. So God, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? They're still rolling around in the mud. They're dirty. They're unclean. You, being a holy and perfect God, can't be in relationship with these dirty people. 
And God then sends his son. And this is where his blood comes into play. That his blood is what washes us. Is that as we are these broken and dirty and fallen people that choose our own selfish ways, as we manipulate, as we're greedy, as we're slanderous, as we do all these things that are wrong, God looks at us and says, I love you so much that I am going to do all the work in cleaning you. Which leads to the other power. The next power of the resurrection, the power of resurrection is that we are promised glorification. We are promised, and and this word glorification, the glory of God, the, the amazing awesomeness of God, the power of God, the perfection of God, this glorification that, that God is saying, I see you're broken and I will glorify you. I will bring glorification to you. And so what does that mean? Is that God is saying, I see that you're broken. I see that you're hurting. And I love you. I care about you. And this is not the way that I intended you to look. This is not the way I intended you to live your life. You're living your life in a way that is devoid of purpose. It's devoid of meaning. You're running the rat race that has no end. You're you're like someone who's wandering on a journey that has no proper map, has no proper direction, and you're just mindlessly running around, and you are just dispersing and just going out that I'm going to glorify you. I'm going to make you whole. I'm going to bring to this place a newness. What I see so interestingly about the promise of glorification and the idea of becoming glorified, and it just sounds so, I know it sounds so spiritual, it sounds so 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 churchy, but what I find so interesting is that we see this with the resurrected Christ. You know, when you die, (laughs) when you die and you go to heaven, um, there there is this idea, it's like, so what is that going to look like? What is it going to look like when we die and we go into heaven? And, uh, you know, there are times in my head I'm like, well, probably, if anything, if I die, maybe we all kind of come together and we're like, this one giant blob that's the church where all of a sudden it's like we all consume together and we're just this one person. And so it's all Christians that come together and there's this one body where we're the church and we're married to Christ. And then there's this like idea to me, it's like, yeah, that kind of makes sense, right? Like we're all just, you know, we all just conglomerate and become this one thing. And then I realized, oh, wait, let me just look into scripture. What, what does scripture say about what heaven is going to look like? And here is something beautiful about the resurrection and that it, it's a promise of this glorification. Jesus gets a body. And, and, and the, the promise regarding this is that when you die, you also will get a body. And, and I know this doesn't sound very big, but this actually proves to me, it shows to me, that God cares about you as an individual. That God sees you as an individual. That it's not just some nameless and faceless person. That God is interested in you as an individual. That he actually cares. Because it's not that Jesus becomes this amorphous blob and then says, okay, now we are all going to be a part of this collective. No, Jesus has a body. And, and this body is one that people can touch. His disciples can, can see the holes in his hands. They can see the holes in his feet. They can interact with him. That eternity does have a physicality to it still. That being in heaven isn't just about being in heaven and we'll be playing harps and and eating grapes and all that stuff. No, that God still has an intended purpose for his creation. That even when we go into heaven, even when we experience the afterlife to come, you are still a created being. And and maybe this is just like I'm going too far off into the craziness. But you are still created. And it will be you are created for all of eternity. And you will begin to have the completed relationship that God has desired for you. Let me go back into John chapter 20 and, and really dive into Mary. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been laying, at one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? 
Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. What I love about this passage, what I love about this is it explains so much to us about what resurrection does. How this is different from the story of Lazarus where Lazarus was raised into his old body. No, Jesus is showing what it looks like now for humanity as we're covered by his blood, as we one day might die in this body. As this body is broken and it has its flaws, its imperfections. And if you don't believe me, just look in the mirror and you'll see those imperfections. That as we have our flaws and our failures... Just the things that happen just living in this world. That Jesus being raised into new life. That remember, he is a man, as he is fully God. That in this new body, he is still Jesus. And and maybe this doesn't mean much to you, but I, I think there's a beauty of this, knowing that for all of eternity, God doesn't look at me and, and, my, and myself and say, you know what, you're too far gone that I'm just going to start over. You know, you're too far gone and you've gone too many things. I'm going to erase your brain and all the neurons and all the things firing, all the memories you have. It's too, it's too messed up. And we're just going to reset your hard drive and then I'll give you a new body and I'll give you a new name. I'll give you a new identity. It'll kind of be like the witness protection program is that when you die and you go to heaven, you know, I'll give you a whole new life. And sometimes we think this way is that we think, okay, this life here on this earth doesn't mean that much because I'm getting a new body in heaven. I'm getting a new body for all of eternity. The beauty is, is that this process of justification and sanctification and glorification, as it's all done by God, it gives us a deeper sense of our identity. That as we go closer to God, we will get to know better how he made us. You know, uh, let me just go, keep going into scripture. Romans 8.30 says this, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. There is this progression that you are learning how to be you. You see, the world, and I, I'm not going to talk too much about the world and society. The world right now is having a major dilemma, a major one, trying to define who you are. And this is where the world is going to say, okay, <laughs> Who am I? And I don't know if you know, but uh, that question is a very loaded question. Who am I? What am I? You know, how do I label myself? What, I, what definitions do I define myself with? And um, what, I, don't, I don't mean to get you riled up, but this question of who am I has become quite the topic. Because people come up with all their answers and all their reasoning. And you know what? Even this is where the religious people will be like, no, 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 no. You, you cannot. You can't define that. You, 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 you shouldn't. Okay, no, just go into the Bible and, and the Bible will tell you who you are. Stop, stop, stop. Okay, but understand that question is a very important one. Before you just tell people to be quiet, stop asking that question. Understand that question is one that is of high importance. God wants you to know who you are. God wants you to come to terms with your identity because he's the one who wrote you. He's the one who made you. He's the one who gave you the personality, the identity that you have. The issue is, is we don't see it fully. We don't see it perfectly. We see it in the broken lens of our understanding, in the broken lens of our context. God is the one who is calling you. He is the one who is justifying you. He is the one who is glorifying you. And he is looking at you and saying, that question of who you are is one that I love because I love you. And I love who you really are. I love you at the core of who you are. And then we'll begin to say, so God, what am I? And God says, great question. Great, great question. What are you? And we'll begin to say, well, okay, I'm a sinner or I'm messed up. I lie. I cheat. I steal. I mean, I'm usually good, but there are times where I make mistakes. And, and God is going to say, okay, you're, you're right, but you're also wrong. What, what, do you, what do you mean I'm wrong? 
Yes, you do all those bad things, but if you've been covered by my son's blood, if you've been washed away clean, if all those things, I, I actually don't know about that anymore. I've forgotten that side of you. All of that is now dead. And now what I see in you is the glorified self. Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21 says this. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. What God is looking at and he's saying, no, 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 you're my, you're my kid. You, your identity is now as a citizen of my kingdom. And, and I think this is where, as a Christian, we need to teach people, we need to have them understand that the way best to identify yourself, the way best to understand who you are at who you are at a core is that you are a child of God. You are loved by him. And there is a desire for you to be called into the kingdom. And it's in the kingdom that you will be you will be re-educated about your identity because you've been living outside the kingdom. And outside the kingdom, people tell you that you have no birthright, that you have no father, that there is no God, and this God doesn't love you. And so you live life like an orphan, just going out into the world, and you just, like an orphan, just trying to find your identity. Who am I? And when people ask you, who are you, you'll say, I'm, I'm an orphan. I have, I have no heavenly father. I am living in this world, in the physical world, where there is nothing but what I can see. And so I need to hustle. I need to produce. I need to do what I, what I can. I need to become a little bit more rough-edged. I need to be a little aggressive because I'm by myself. And so my identity is based in me being by myself. And so I'm going to get to know who I am under this assumption that I'm by myself. You see, God is saying this, you're not by yourself. And this is where we'll be like, no, 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 stop. I am by myself. And God is going to say, he's going to look at us and say, you are not alone. And God, in his grace, will send people into your life who love you and care about you, who will reach out to you and say, you aren't alone. But what I see time and time again are people who just say, no, I am alone in this world. And I am identifying myself. I am identifying my existence as alone. And God is just constantly saying, you are alone, but I want you with me. I want you in my kingdom. I want you in my house. I want you to be in the place you're called to be. And you are not meant to be this orphan living life alone in this world, just completely by yourself. You are called to be in the kingdom as my child. And yes, you may not have the same kind of freedoms that you do outside the walls, but as my child, you also have freedom. That as my child in my kingdom, you have the freedom to be who you are meant to be. And because he's our heavenly father, he's the one who knows us the best. He knows what we are called to be. And so through Christ and through the washing of his blood, we are given this new life. And finally, the power of, of resurrection is that it begins to build our foundation for our life and for our ethics. I perhaps don't talk about this a lot, but I think I'll let Scripture explain this first. Romans 6 verse 11 says this. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The beauty of the resurrection is to explain that there is death involved in this walk to Christ, in this walk to God. And it's now that you are dead to the old things. And you are now alive in this new, in this new reality. And you see, for Jesus, you see, for Jesus, the difference didn't look that big. I mean, his, his first body and his second body may have looked different in appearance, but his heart was so pure that there really is a, a, a parallel aspect to both his earthly ministry and now his heavenly one. He's Jesus. He was perfect. But for us... You see, for us, our earthly selves, our earthly bodies, we are bound still by sin. And we understand that there is this glorification process, this cleansing process, this sanctification process. 
And so now we understand, and this is, this is really how uh, it, it's going to free you. I hope it frees you. The body you have right now is just the lease. The life you live right now is just the lease. It's not to say it's not important. It's still you. You're, you're still, it's still individually you, and I pray that you get to know how God loves you as an individual. He, he cares about you. He cares about your life. Just because it's a lease, just because this is just a rental, doesn't mean that you don't matter. You matter, but it's this body that is not going to last forever. You know, oh, like, again, I think some of us are like, thank God this body is just a rental because I have wrecked it. Like, I have messed it up to all God knows what. But the idea is this, that as this body is a rental, and you know that it is a rental, that you know that this life that you live is going to go and return back to dust, how are you going to use it? How are you going to live this life? And this really is, if this really is a rental and you believe in Jesus and you're covered by his blood, you're in. There's no question about your salvation. If you believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter, and I'm going to say this very clearly, it doesn't matter how you live your life. The work has been done. All right, let me say it again. It doesn't matter how you live your life. God forgives all past, present, and future sin. If you're under Christ, you are forgiven. And I hope that comes, I hope that comes as a solace to you, that it's not about what you do. But here's, here's the thing. Okay, so you've been saved, and this body is a rental. This body will, will die and return to dust. And you will be given this eternal body like Jesus where it's still you. It's still you with all of your thoughts and all of your dreams, all of your hopes and desires. But this body, this, this being is a rental. What are you going to do about it? You've been saved. You're in. But you're going to live in this rental another 40, 50, 60, 70 years. What are you going to do? And this is where the Christian or I guess the one who has a relationship with God can ask, oh, what can I do? God, what should I do if this body is a rental? And I, I just want to play devil's advocate. Okay, if it's a rental, then I'm going to be as greedy. <laughs> I'm going to lie. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to steal. I'm going to do whatever I want because this isn't me. This isn't my body. This isn't who I am. I can just party it up and God will forgive me and God will love me. <laughs> I think for some of us, especially the, you know, the younger ones, probably like, yeah, that sounds great. You know, I would love to, to follow Jesus. I would love to be able to do what I want to do and follow Jesus. Wait a second. You see, this is where that big first friction comes into play. You see, a lot of times we, we try to think, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to make this argument. Then you're not following Jesus. You're following you. If you come to this point in which you realize this body is a rental... And you're like, okay, so if it's a rental, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Then you can't say you're following Jesus. You see, the profession of faith is saying that he is my savior. And a lot of times we're so good with that. Jesus, you're my savior. You wash me. That's not all that salvation is. You're not in because you just say he's your savior. You have to say he's your king. And this is where it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm good with Jesus saving me. I'm good with Jesus washing his blood over me, but him being my king? We don't have kings anymore. Well, I mean, we, have, we don't really have that. And if anything, I don't, I don't want to be subject. I don't want to be under someone. And so the answer is then, yeah, you, you don't have to be under Jesus. You can live your life the way you want to. No one is forcing you under subjection to him. But if the answer is, yo, know, he's my savior and he's my king, and so when the question becomes, how should you live in your body, well, what is he saying? What does he say that I should be doing? And, and we've boiled it down to something really simple. You love God and you love others. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The most freeing thing about the Christian walk, is that you are no longer the one who's in charge. And the reason why I say it's so freeing is because when I'm in charge, I mess things up. I mess things up because I'm selfish. 
And because I don't see the big picture, I mess things up because I'm very emotional. I, I, I'm very short-tempered. I'm, I'm very broken as a person. And so when I'm the king, when I have all the things that I'm in charge of, when I try to have sovereignty over my life, I just mess things up. And so there is a freeing, a freeing thing about being under a king who lived the perfect life. It's because it's no longer I who live. That I've been crucified with him. My old ways where I was the one in charge has died. And this new life, my new ethic, the way that I will view life is that I, I, don't, have anything, I don't have anything for me as an individual to offer to you. But I can follow him. And as I follow him, what Jesus shows me is who I am. You see, this is the beautiful thing. You were never created to define yourself. Uh, the world, and I, I said I wouldn't talk a lot about the world, but I'm going to say it. The world wants you to say, follow your heart. Know thyself. You know, like really dive deep into who you are and follow, follow your hopes and your dreams and your deepest desires. It sounds good because it's almost true. You see, the reason why it's not true is because, yes, you should know who you are. But if you look in there, you're just going to see a lot of darkness, a lot of blackness, a lot of brokenness. But if you ask your father, if you ask your Lord, who am I? This is where your relationship with God can grow deep. Because God, when he looks into your heart, he's going to say, you're my beloved child. You're the one I, I love, and I see your giftings. I see your abilities. I see your hopes. I know your dreams. And we'll say, how? How do you know these things? And he's going to say, well, I'm God, but I, I'm the one who gave you those hopes. I'm the one who gave you those dreams. And it was never intended for you to live this life on your own to fulfill your own hopes and dreams. That's my job. I want to be the one who fulfills your hopes and dreams. That's the heart of the father. The father doesn't look at the children and say, hey, get out of my house. I don't want you here anymore. The heart of the father is to say, I, I want to help you. I want to walk with you. I want to coach you. I want to be with you. And as I help you and coach you and train you, and as you grow, you're going to be more of who you are. Church, we are, we are here today because we are celebrating a miracle. One in which the Savior of the world died and was risen from the grave. And even in that, we're such selfish beings that we really ask ourselves, what do I get out of it? You know, what's in it for me? Like this day, it's supposed to be a happy day, so what do I get out of it? And I'm trying to explain to you, what you get out of it is a relationship with the Most High God with your Father in heaven, and he is longing for you. He desires, he desires five minutes of your time. And I know you're thinking, I, I've sat here for like 45 minutes. I've sat here for an hour and a half. You know, like, isn't that enough? It's not enough. He wants your undivided attention. And if anything, on Easter, the beauty of the resurrection is God is saying to you, I love you, I want you, I want to be in your life, I want to be able to speak to you, I want to lead you and guide you. And I think a lot of times we're going to say, it's like, I'm, I'm good. I enjoy living this life on my own. I enjoy doing it the way I see fit. The wonderful thing is God is infinitely gracious. He's patient. He's kind. He's merciful. And I pray that this isn't your last Easter service. But I also know that every Easter service, we come with our own and different baggage. And each year, each Sunday, each day, I will say it is time for you to realize that the old has gone so that the new has come. You are a child of God, dearly beloved, forgiven, washed by the blood of Jesus. And so now the life we live is no longer in us, but it's in Humble submission to our Savior. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this Easter Sunday, Lord, where you are raised and you, you were resurrected from the dead into a glorified body. Lord, I know that makes us sound crazy, that we believe that a man could come to new life in a new body. Lord, I pray that, that we would simply understand the depth of your supernatural power. Father, you are a God that works above the natural order and that we are able to witness and see your strength, your power, your touch in our lives. 
Father, I pray you would help us understand ourselves, not in light of our own perspective, our own wisdom, or even what society tells us to be, but Lord, we would be identified by our Father in heaven. And Father, I thank you that you have called us beloved, that you care about us, you desire a relationship with us. I pray you would give us the humility to die to ourselves so that we could find our new life in Christ. Father, I thank you that you care about us, that you loved us so much that you would send your one and only son to die for us, and that it's through the resurrection that we know the new covenant has been fulfilled. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.